Good morning, and thank you all for joining today's Science, Conservation, and Humanities Lecture presented by the New York Botanical Garden. My name is Charles Zimmerman. It is my pleasure to welcome you from locations across the United States and around the world to today's seminar, 39 Years of Palm Research at NYBG, a Retrospective. At any time during today's event, please feel welcome to submit questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your window, and our hosts will raise these for our speaker to answer at the end. Live captions can be enabled by clicking the CC button, then show subtitles or view full transcript. You can also hide these captions if you'd prefer not to see them. This event is being recorded and it will be shared on the NYBG Lecture Library. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Balick, Vice President for Botanical Science and Director of the Institute of Economic Botany at the New York Botanical Garden, who will introduce today's speaker, Dr. Andrew Henderson. Good morning, everyone. I first met Andrew in 1977 when he received a fellowship from Kew to participate in a scientific expedition. And we were both lucky enough to be invited by Ian Prantz to go on a Progetto Flora Amazonica trip. This one for two months to collect along the newly constructed Trans-Amazon Highway from Santarém to Cuiabá, Brazil. Now at the conclusion of the trip, Andrew was so excited by what we'd done, he asked Ian how he could transition from horticulture to systematic botany. And Ian suggested that Andrew do a botany degree at the University of London and then come study at the New York Botanical Garden. In 1982, Andrew began graduate school through the CUNY program with a specialty in palms and following his graduate studies, did a postdoc at the garden and joined the curatorial staff in 1992. He has been an editor of Britonia and Flora Neotropica, two of the garden's impactful scientific publication series. Now, Andrew is one of the world's greatest authorities on palms, having undertaken field work around the world and produced many significant contributions during his career. For example, he's monographed 18 genera of New World Palms, many of these published in Florinia Tropica, and he's written 10 books on palms. His most recognized book is A Field Guide to the Palms of the Americas, written with his dear friends and collaborators, Rodrigo Bernal and Gloria Galeano. As evidence of its impact, this book has been cited 1400 times in other publications, according to Google Scholar, an extraordinary accomplishment. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Henderson, who will offer a retrospective of his career. Okay, so is that, I'm not sure, is that working? Yep, we can see you great. Okay, very good. Okay, so thank you very much, Mike. Um, as Mike said, and as Charlie said, I'm gonna talk about my time at New York Botanical Garden. Hard to imagine now it's been 39 years. But I first, I'm gonna talk a little bit to begin with about how I actually ended up in New York in the first place. And in 1980, 1977, now I'm doing, I'm sorry, I'm doing my, it's not changing. Charlie, I'm having trouble changing the, the, the uh, screen. I'm doing page down and nothing's happening here. Um, try using your mouse uh, in the PowerPoint app. But just a second, Charlie. All right, so I've got the first slide up and I, I'm doing page down, but I'm the first slide doesn't, doesn't move to the next one. What should I do here? Um, try uh, minimizing your PowerPoint slide and and re restarting the PowerPoint. Actually, I can't. I'm doing escape and nothing's happening at all. Should I stop sharing? Uh, sure. Let's let's try to do that again. Stop share. All right. So now, so now I'm going to go to share screen. Yes. Let's try that again. Share screen. 
I'm going to click on my PowerPoint. I'm going to do share. I'm back at my thing and I'm still stuck. First, that first slide, that first picture. What am I doing can, wrong? Can you hit enter, Andrew? Yeah, I'm hitting enter and I'm hitting page down and not making any difference. I'm not moving. Hmm. I'm not moving. Sorry uh, for folks in the audience. We tested this out before and it worked fine. So we're having some technical issues here. Um, Shall I try that again? Stop sharing and see if that, I can do it again. Yeah. Click your mouse on the PowerPoint, please. Wait a second. I'm going to do share screen. Then I'm going to click on my seminar. Then I'm going to click on share. And I'm going to go page down and I'm still stuck. Um, can you make the PowerPoint not full screen and run it as a not full screen presentation? That might work better. Well, I can't do anything unless I stop sharing. Right, yeah, do that first. Stop sharing, now I'm gonna minimize. All right, is, this, is that working now? Is that okay now, Charlie? Um, you're not sharing, so you have to start sharing again before we can see what you are working on. All right, so I'm gonna minimize. So now I'm going to share screen. Now nothing's happening. Now I'm going to click on my presentation. Now I'm going to do share. All right. Can you change slides now? Wait a second. Yes. OK. So okay, we're, good. we're good to go. Sorry about that technical hitch. So anyway, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about how I came to be, came to be at New York in the first place. And as Mike said, in 19. 77. I was a horticultural student at Kew Gardens in London and I got at the end of the course I got some money. I was on a horticultural diploma course and I got some money to travel in the tropics. I think the only condition of the grant was to go to the tropics. And I went over to the herbarium at Kew and I talked to some of the botanists and one of them said to me well you should write to Ian Prance and at that time Ian was the director of um, of science at New York Botanical Garden. So I wrote to Ian, I said, I've got some money. And he wrote back and said, well, you can come with me in October 1977. I'm going on a trip on the Trans-Amazon Highway. And so I arrived in Brazil in October 1977 in order to take part in this Progetto Flora trip. And that was the time the Trans-Amazon Highway just opened at that time. That was uh, soon after it opened. It was a dump back through the forest, literally. And I'm sure you've heard about people or read about people who've from temperate zone, from cold places, have gone to the tropics and have been sort of overwhelmed by the experience. And that was exactly what happened to me. Uh, the, the tropical forest really sort of, it, it literally overwhelmed me. And I remember flying from Manaus to Belém, flying over the forest, and you're just staggering the size of the, of the Amazon forest. So anyway, I went on this trip. I collected plants with, with Ian and Mike along, this, uh, along the highway. And Ian was a, he was an inspiration to me. He was really, a, he was a, I'm saying was, a, he is a wonderful guy and really inspired me. And I, I remember um, thinking, this is, boy, this is what I want to do. I want to be a tropical botanist. And the other person on that trip was Michael Balick. There's a very young looking Mike there. And at that time, Mike was, he was, he was doing his thesis research on palms. You can see him holding a palm in fluorescence there. And, um, Mike also was a tremendous um, help to me and encouraged me to work on palms and really was helped me and supported me in the, in the coming years. So at the end of that trip, I said to Ian, Ian, I want to be a botanist. And he said, well, you better get yourself a degree, and, which I didn't have at the time. And I went back to England. I got a degree from London University. I wrote to Ian again, applying to enter the program, the joint program between the Botanical Garden and CUNY. And I was admitted to that program and I arrived in New York in 1982. And I became a graduate student for the next five years from 82 to 87. And Ian Prance was my advisor. And I worked on a, uh, a revision of this group of palms, Secretia, Iriatia, Iriatalia, and all neotropical palms. And that research, that thesis research was published in 1990 in this Flora Neotropica. And soon after that, I was a postdoc for a short time. And then soon after that, I was hired on the staff of the garden. And that was a, uh, 
that was a great group of people to work with. This picture was taken, uh, I asked Barbara Tears about this, she said she thought 1987. And um, that was a, it, the garden was a great place to work and it was, a, it was a privilege to work there. And it was a great group of people to work with. There's uh, Cronquist and Barnaby up there in the back there and Scott Murray in the front there, and Mike and Ian over here. And it was a wonderful group of people to work with. I counted, I think I counted 23 people. And I was, when I prepared the seminar, I was wondering to myself how many we could muster now if we put the staff on the steps of the museum building. Maybe not quite so many. Anyway, so following that, I spent <clears throat> several years and actually over my whole career working on revisions of various neotropical palm genera. And I made a list of all the genera there on the, on the left side of the screen. And one, um, at that time in the late 80s, early 90s, much of the focus of the research was on the Amazon region because Ian Prance was involved with his refuge theory. So much of the focus of the research was on the Amazon and at the encouragement of Michael Bailick, I worked on this book um, about the palms of the Amazon. And this was published in 1995 by Oxford University Press and covered 151 species in 31 genera. And I'm gonna come back to that number 151 in a minute. Didn't when I when I finished the book, I thought it's not very many species considering the size of the of the forest. And at that same time, during those same years, I worked quite a lot in this um, on this project over here on the left. That was a biological dynamics of forest fragments project in Brazil, and this famous research site, Kilometer 41 near Manaus. And I worked with Brazilian students, and we did a lot of um, studies in this forest on phenology and reproductive biology and pollination, all these kind of things. So anyway, to get back to that um, 151 species, I remember talking about this to um, my colleagues Steve Churchill and Jim Lutine, and in 1991 we wrote a short paper published in Nature about neotropical plant diversity, and we said that the Northern Andes, both Jim and Steve worked in the Northern Andes, we said that in the Northern Andes with a much smaller surface area than the Amazon region and much more um, highly deforested, more, almost 90 to 95% deforested. And the diversity there was as great as the whole of the Amazon basin, which we put down as 7 million um, square kilometers. And we, at that time we said 8 to 11% deforested. So we tried to make the point that the Northern Andes was, was much smaller, more deforested, more diverse. Had we, um, if we'd written this paper today, we would have to change that figure from a deforestation in the Amazon to more than 20%. So in that short time, that short 30 year period, um, more than 10% of the Amazon forest has been has disappeared. Now, the other thing I was been interested in over the years, um, many people, many people grow palms, many people have gardens and hobbyists and, and horticulture, especially in places like Florida and California. And many people would ask me, what palm is this or what palm is that? And they'd show me a picture of a palm in their garden. And there was obviously, a, it, it was very difficult of them to sort of, to the botanical literature. So I would publish my monographs and floras in these obscure botanical journals written in botanical jargon that nobody can understand in Latin for heaven's sake part of it. And there was obviously a need to make this kind of sort of arcane botanical information available to a much wider audience. And so in, um, we worked for several years of this, and in 1995, um, myself and my colleagues, my friends and colleagues, Gloria Galliano and whoops, Rodrigo Bernal, um, published this book, Field Guide to Palms of the Americas. And that was uh, published by Princeton University Press. And as Mike said, it's um, been cited more than 1400 times. And there was obviously a need for this kind of, to make this technical botanical information much, much more available to more available to a wider audience. And the other um, project I worked on during these years was um, a study of the evolution and ecology of palms. And this, um, what I was trying to do here was to, to review, to try and bring together all this um, botanical information published in all sorts of different places um, about palms and bring it all together in one place. And there were chapters on growth and development and size and shape of stems and life history and reproduction, etc. And this book was published in 2009 by New York Botanical Garden Press. Now, I was, um, became interested in this genus, Geonoma. And Geonoma, very um, common and widespread in the Amazon region. It's 
Central America and Central America, South America, all through the Neotropics, you'll find um, geonomas growing in the, especially in the understory. And so I began a revision of this. I looked at the um, previous revisions and it, uh, geonoma was revised by a German botanist, Max Burrett in 1930, who recognized 172 species and by a Dutch botanist, Wessels Bohr in 1968, who recognized 75 species. And you may wonder, and I wondered myself at the time, how could be such different estimates of the number of species in the same genus? And I, I wondered, is systematics, is taxonomy purely subjective? Does the number of species depend entirely on the person who's doing the revision? I became interested in this subject, and I became interested in the idea that there, there might be a, what I took to be a scientific way to do systematics. And what I tried to come up with was an explicit quantitative hypothesis-based methodology to do um, systematics. And in this um, scheme, the previously described species were the hypotheses to be tested, and the methodology was based on the phylogenet phylogenetic species concept. And as I'm sure you know, there are any number of species concepts, any number of papers and books and symposia discussing species concepts. It's a, it's a, a a very broad and complicated topic. But anyway, so I chose this particular um, phylogenetic species concept because I thought it was operational. You could use it in order to delimit species. And it's defined as the smallest aggregation of populations diagnosable by a unique combination of character states and comparable individuals. And characters are qualitative variables of which only one state is found in all comparable individuals. And uh, traits are qualitative variables of which more than one state occurs within the species. So the, it boils down to, the thing boils down to distinguishing between characters and traits. Unfortunately, that turned out to be a lot more complicated than, than I thought it would be. And it was, I, I'm still trying to, trying to, um, I've been interested in this topic over the years, trying to define, trying to make a, a, what I take to be a scientific method for doing taxonomy. Anyway, so genoma, unfortunately, turned out not to be the best, um, genus to try out my new, my new method um, for a couple of reasons. One is hybrids. And it turns out that there are many hybrids in genoma. And of course, from a Hamerian specimen, you can't really, it's difficult to say for sure whether something is a hybrid or not, but usually you can have a reasonably good idea. And in this case, I put an example here, um, genoma diversa over there on the, on the left and genoma leptospatics on the right. And in the middle is a specimen that I take to be a hybrid between these two species. And if you map these hybrids, um, these crosses on the map are hybrids, what I take to be hybrids between the two species. You can see there's actually a hybrid zone um, going from Suriname and, um, trying to get my mouse over there, Suriname, French Guiana, and uh, Amapá in northeastern Brazil. And I took that to be a hybrid zone between these um, two species. And that um, complicates matters. And there are many other hybrids in genome. That complicates the limitation of species between us. And the other, <coughs> excuse me, the other problem um, that is that in genome, there are several species. These are very, very widespread, variable, um, species in one place, you can find a one particular form and you can go to another place and find a different form. And you can go to other places and you find two different forms or intermediates. And there is a huge range in variation, particularly in leaf shape and division. So in these three species, Macrostachys, Maxima, and Stricta, similar variation, you can have the pinnate leaf ones all the way across to narrow, simple ones. And these species complex are all sort of intractable. They're very difficult to, uh, to deal with based on um, aberrant specimens. And I hope that uh, in the future, we'll, uh, molecular data will certainly um, help us understand these species complexes. But anyway, they make it much more difficult to delimit species um, in general, in, in genome in particular. Anyway, this, so this work was published, Revision of Genome published in 2011. Now, um, in 2003, I made the first trip to Asia and one thing I want to say here, I think one of the strengths of the research program at the Botanical Garden is that the curators, the scientists have had complete freedom to work wherever they like. And I don't think that's true of, um, of other institutions. I think other comparable institutions, Botanical Gardens, 
um, people are pretty much directed to work on this or that project. But at the Pacific Garden, we've always had this wonderful academic freedom to work wherever we, wherever our interests take us. So in 2003, I made my first trip to, to Asia. Um, this was a project working with Wildlife Conservation Society. This was a survey of, uh, of some palms in Asia I'll talk about in a second. But this was a, uh, this was a very interesting trip. I went with Chuck Peters, Chuck over there on the left side in the t-shirt in the picture there. There's the, the crew from WCS. And I just want to say one thing about these elephants, these Asian elephants. They're pretty amazing. They can carry a lot of stuff, as you can see on there. They're, and they're incredibly strong. They're much smaller than African elephants, but incredible how strong they are. And if I can get this little video to work, we were trying to collect the palm along the side of the road and we couldn't and palms have these terrible um, thorns and it, it, it was, we had several guys try to pull it down and so they came up, the guys came along and they took it up. Again. So anyway, there we are. There we are collecting a collecting a palm with an elephant. Anyway, so this project in this trip in Myanmar was to survey the palms along the Lido Road, and the Lido Road goes through this northern part of Myanmar. Um, in Kachin State, this is pretty much all forested. It's a uh, the reason it's still forested is because it's a very difficult place to to live. It floods a lot in the wet season. There's a lot of malaria, so it's a pretty inhospitable place. And that Lido Road was built during the Second World War. It was built by the Americans to send supplies from northeastern India through northern Myanmar into China to supplies to the Chinese who were fighting the Japanese. And by the time they finished the road, it would cost a lot of lives to build that road. By the time they finished, the war ended and it was pretty much abandoned. And Wildlife Conservation Society were, were setting up a tiger reserve, the Hukong Valley Tiger Reserve. So our project was to survey the palms and especially the rattans along the Lido Road. So here is the road um, going over a river and here is a bridge. And this bridge, if you look at this bridge, this bridge is amazing. This bridge is held, there's not a single nail in this bridge. This bridge is held together by rattans. And if you look more closely, um, the bridge is held together by these rattans. So rattans are these climbing palms with very flexible, um, very and tie things. But um, elephants not so impressed because they used to walk down the side. They refused to cross the bridge for some reason. It's perfectly safe, but they, the elephants wouldn't walk on it. Anyway, so I'm going to talk more about rattans in a second. So the same, in the same, using the same. Um, Many, many of these palms from this region were cultivated and people would say, what species have I got growing in my garden? And this was, a, again, an attempt to make And this botanical garden covers 43 genera and just over 400 species. And I'm getting a message on my screen saying your internet connection is, uh, maybe went away. Hope for the best, touch wood. So um, this, um, this book covered all of the palms in all of these countries from all the way over Pakistan, all the way over to Japan. But most species are in this re region here in Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam, and Myanmar. And this book did not include Philippines, it did not include Malaysia, it did not include um, Indonesia because there were just so many species it would have made it too, just too much. Maybe in my, in my next lifetime, I'll work on those countries. But anyway, um, we, I, this book was published in, in 2009. And while I was working on this book, it was very clear. Um, it was very obvious to me that there was one country that was very, very poorly known botanically, and that was Vietnam. And I became um, fascinated. And it turned out that the, the reason why Vietnam is so poorly known is obvious that Vietnam was in at war for in conflict for many years during the times up to the Second World War and after the Second World War and then the French came back and the French left and the Americans arrived 
And it wasn't until 1975 that Vietnam was um, united, was at peace. And even after 1975, it, Vietnam went through some very difficult times for many years. And it wasn't until the late 80s, early 90s that people, um, that Vietnamese um, biologists could start doing field work and they could start collaborating with their overseas colleagues. And there was a sort of an explosion of, of research and an incredible number of new um, texts are discovered in Vietnam. And the most famous was, was this one, the Sao La. And this is a large mammal. It's a deer, a deer-sized mammal that was unknown to science until, until uh, the early 1990s. So I um, began a project in Vietnam. And much of my research in the last 10 years or so has been in Vietnam. And so again, looked at the literature to see what had been done and um, found that this, this flora produced by French botanists published in 1937. And these two botanists, Gagnapan and Conrad, they said there were 60 species of in 17 genera in Vietnam. And so this was our starting point. And over the years, <coughs> excuse me, over these years since 2006, we've made 18 trips to Vietnam and over 60 collecting localities. Over 900 herbarium specimens, and that's actually now near a thousand specimens, and described 56 new species and one new genus for the country. And so we now recognize 129 native species in 23 genera. And that's more than double the number of the species that were, that were previously recognized. And this research has been funded by a Fulbright Scholar Program. I was a, spent five months in Vietnam in 2006 as a Fulbright Scholar. Um, National Geographic Society, National Science Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and the World Wildlife Fund. Now, so we've traveled all over Vietnam. Um, this is the extreme northern part of Vietnam, just over those hills in the background is the border with China. Um, some, not much forest here, but some pretty spectacular scenery. We've traveled in the central part of Vietnam. This is the um, Ho Chi Minh Highway. Um, this is a view from the Ho Chi Minh Highway, looking towards the border. And again, I want to say, <clears throat> I want to just emphasize one thing here. Um, that again, if you read, if you, if you live in North America or in Europe and you read about the tropics, you read that deforestation, there's nothing left. But in fact, um, even though there is a huge amount of deforestation, we talked about the Amazon earlier, there are still very, very large areas of intact forest. And you can stand where this picture was taken as far as you can see to the horizon is hills covered with forest. And I think one of the most important things we can do as botanists is to collect in these remaining areas of forest because they won't be they certainly won't be there for very much longer. And we worked all the way down into the extreme southern part of Vietnam. Um, this is called Bao Island off the southern part of Vietnam. This was an island where the French colonialists used to send political Anyway, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this, in what, well, our, our work, during our work in Vietnam, we were particularly interested in this genus, Licuala. And we collected Licualas, we collected DNA samples, and we knew, we, we recognized that some of them were a little bit different. We weren't quite sure about these. They certainly looked a lot like Licualas, but they were dioecious, whereas Licuala is monoecious. And in Vietnam, they're called Lanon, which means, um, Hat palm, these are the hat palms. And anyway, so we, as I say, we collected DNA samples and we, um, the reason they're called hat palms is because they're used to make hats and people go out into the forest, they will collect the unopened, the youngest unopened leaves, um, they'll sell them in the markets. And this lady, Miss Chang, showed us how to, um, how she made the hats from the, from the, um, from the leaves. And she would flatten the leaves on this hot plate over here and then she would sew them onto this, um, sew the leaves on this bamboo frame. Very beautiful the way she, she made the hat. And pretty much everywhere you go in Vietnam, you will see people wearing um, these hats. All over Vietnam, people wear these hats. And if you buy a postcard, you get So anyway, we sent our DNA samples um, to our colleague, Christine Bacon, in that time, she was at Colorado University in, in North America. And sometime later, Christine came back and she said, Andrew, your licuales are not licuales at all. They are more related to this genus, Johannes Tasmania. And this 
picture at this arm over here on the right, that is a Johannes Tasmania. And I think you will agree that, that, that the leaves of this palm bear no relation whatsoever to the leaves of this one um, over here on the right, on the right side of the screen. And this was a very good example um, of the power of DNA data, because I don't think from morphology, in fact, I'm sure from morphology, you would never know, you can never tell the relationships of these, of these palms. So specimens previously thought to belong to Liquiala, shown by DNA evidence to belong to a new genus. And Christine and I described this as Lanonia after the Vietnamese word for the palm. And there is a publication that was in Systematic Botany published in <clears throat> 2011. And that um, plate there is the plate that appeared in the publication. So that was very interesting. That was a very interesting uh, um, discovery. And there is the distribution of um, Lanonia. There's about eight species, more than that now, but at that time there were eight species in Vietnam. One species in Hainan and one species in extreme, where is my mouse, in extreme Western Java. And that kind of distribution is not so unusual in the, in the Asian tree. And presumably came about because of changes in Pleistocene, changes in sea level. And as the, um, as the uh, glaciers increased and the sea level fell, so there was contiguous land split between Hainan and central Vietnam and all through here into Java. So those kind of distributions presumably a result of changes in, in sea level during the Pleistocene. All right, so we, we summarized all of our um, research in this book. This was published in 2018, I guess it was, um, with myself and my colleague, Mr. Zung. And this was published by New York Botanical Garden. And here's a, uh, here is Mr. Zung, my colleague, Mr. Zung, um, who's been a great colleague, a great friend over the years. And Mr. Zung works for FIPI, that is the his job to travel all over Vietnam and um, <clears throat> and survey areas for potential nature reserves or national parks. So he knows the country. He knows what so he's been a wonderful person to work with over the years. And these two pages, these are two facing pages in um, from the book. Um, this again, this was laid out in a field guide format, so a very non-technical language. And this book was designed, the design was done by a summer intern at the Botanical Garden, Catherine Labarca. And uh, Catherine worked also over in the, in the lab with Barbara Ambrose. But anyway, so Catherine turned out to be a very talented designer and she designed this book and did a very, very nice job um, of, of, uh, of laying everything out. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about <clears throat> I said earlier that I became interested in rattans when I was in that first trip in Myanmar. So rattans are spiny climbing palms whose stems are widely used in the rattan industry. They're widely used for all sorts of things, for tying, as I said earlier, especially in the rattan furniture industry. And that's a big business. It's a very important business. Um, people buy rattan furniture pretty much everywhere. And this picture at the bottom here on the left is a rattan furniture shop in Hanoi in Vietnam. And uh, you can see they have baskets and chairs and all the stuff made from, made from rattan. Almost all rattan are in the genus Calamus and there are several problems for the rattan sector, including over harvesting and lack of knowledge of systematics and conservation. So myself and my colleague, Chuck Peters, um, we work with colleagues in, in these three countries. Um, on this problem when we produced this book, Systematic Ecology and Management of Rattans in Vietnam. And we subtitled it The Biological Bases of Sustainable Use. And this was, um, had several different field guide, again, the field guide, so the identification of the species, it had conservation assessments of each species, and it had tools for sustainable management. And that was uh, mostly Chuck's work and Chuck did a lot of uh, transects and surveys here the, on the bottom here are the guys doing a survey in Vietnam. Based on all the data he collected, he was able to say how much rattan could be collected um, based on density data and growth rate data, how much could be collected from the forest without detrimentally affecting the, the population. And this was, uh, this research was funded by the MacArthur Foundation, the Wildlife, Wildlife Fund. 
and Ikea. Ikea, of course, interested in rattan because of the furniture. And we produced a very similar book for Myanmar, um, maybe not quite so detailed, but this was published in 18. And both these books, this, uh, this um, Systematics and College of Rattans was published in, the, in local languages. Uh, and this book, Myanmar, was published in Sri Lanka. It actually had the, the end of the book, it had the translation into Myanmar language. All right, so I'm going to talk now about <clears throat> this genus, Calamus, and um, this is the Rattan genus. Um, and I began a revision of this Calamus in 2011. And at that time, there were thought to be about 500 species confined to the Asian tropics. And I, in the years since 2011, I've looked at 8,634 specimens from 47 Habera. That sounds like a lot, but actually it's not very many because um, compared to other plants, because rattans are very, very difficult to collect. Um, there's a picture of a rattan over here on the right. They're extremely difficult to pull down from the forest. I showed you that picture once. We had to have an elephant to collect this dirt. Um, very difficult to collect, and there tend to be rather few specimens in Herbaria. And even worse than that, these specimens are scattered across Herbaria in the US, Europe, and Asia, and it's almost impossible to bring them all together. It's impossible to borrow specimens from all these different Herbaria in Asia and these different places. So that was one of the biggest difficulties in the, in the revision, these um, the specimens were all scattered about. And I carried out field work in various places in Australia and Cambodia, etc. And at the same time I was doing this, or in the later years I was doing this, colleagues at Kew Gardens in England were working on a phylogeny of Calamus. So many of the specimens I would collect in the field, I would collect a DNA sample, I would send it to the folks at Kew. And they were producing a phylogeny based on next generation DNA sequencing. And that's almost finished. It's very exciting to see it almost finished. Hopefully it'll be published this year. So the result of all this research, this um, revisionary research and phylogenetic research will be a revision and phylogeny of Calamus. And that's almost one fifth of all palm species in this genus Calamus. So it'll be a big step forward for, um, for palm systematics in general. So when I, there is a distribution of all Calamus species, um, there's one species in West Africa, West and Central Africa. Um, they occur all the way from the Western Gaps of India all the way across to Vanuatu. Um, most species, the most diverse area is um, the Sunda Shelf area, this Malay Peninsula, Sumatra and Borneo, most species are there. But they're still pretty widespread um, over other places. And while I was working on um, this revision of Calamus, it, um, it was obvious that there was one particular place, and that's Sulawesi, that was very, very poorly known, just as Vietnam was very poorly known working on the field guide. Sulawesi was obviously very poorly known for Calamus, and it occupies a very, um, it's, a, it's an island, it's between, uh, situated between Borneo over here on the west and, and New Guinea to the, to the east. Very interesting area by Jack biogeographically. It's been isolated for a long time and there are lots of endemic species. So I knew I had to try and do some field work in Sulawesi and from September 2017 to January 2018 I spent those months in Sulawesi doing, um, doing field work funded by a Fulbright Scholar Award and we collected 180, spe 180 specimens including DNA samples and we discovered about 12 new species. There are no doubt many more. We, felt sometimes that we were hardly scratching the surface. There is a picture of one of our new species over there on the right. Did I mention that, that rattans are spiny? You're probably thinking, you're probably wondering who in their right mind would want to study Calamus. And I did, I was based at Tadalaku University in Palu and did a little bit of teaching while I was there, did quite a lot of teaching while I was there. And there I am with some of the students in Tadalaku University. And, um, I'm going to repeat myself here. I said earlier I was talking about forests in Vietnam. Before I went to Sulawesi, I read about Sulawesi and that you, you could get the impression that there's hardly a tree left standing because of deforestation. But yes, there is a lot of deforestation in Sulawesi, but there are still huge, huge areas of forest remaining, intact forest remaining. And this picture in the Blue Mountains in northern Sulawesi, you stand by the side of the road, and as far as you can see to the horizon, there's nothing but hills covered with forest. Um, 
And again, I'm, I'm repeating myself, I think it's so important that we should be trying to collect in these areas because no doubt they will be fragmented, they will be destroyed, but at the moment there are still large areas of forest intact in Sulawesi and in many other places. All right, so I'm going to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to stop there. So this, uh, my monograph of, um, of Calamus was published in May of 2020, um, all 656. And um, I thought this was when it was published in May during just the start of the lockdown. And I thought, well, this is probably a good retire uh, this thing being. Thing. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to just show um, some of the organizations that have um, funded my research over the years. I'm very grateful to these organizations. There are others. Ones. And I'm going to finish by saying um, the Botanical Garden is a great institution and it's been a privilege to work there over the years and long may it flourish. Okay, so thank you very much. That's all from me. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Um, again, apologies to the audience for some of the technical difficulties today, um, but I think we all really appreciated you sharing your wisdom and your, and your experience. Um, so at this time, we're ready for the Q&A. Hold on, let me turn my video on. <laughs> Charlie, do I do stop share? Uh, yeah, you can do that now. Um, audience members, uh, you're welcome to add your questions if you haven't already, um, and uh, we'll answer them in the Q&A module. Uh, you're also able to upvote the questions already submitted by others, which helps us prioritize things and make sure that we get to the questions that are most interesting to all of you. Um, so let's get started. Um, we have a few already in the module. Thank you for submitting. Uh, we have a few questions um, about areas of biodiversity that still exist, areas that require um, the most collecting. Uh, Andrew, can you give a sense for what are some of the places, kind of like Vietnam, when you were collecting there, where more field work and study would really produce a large number of new species if we were to do more focused research? Well, yes, I can. Um, those two places I've talked about, if I'm only speaking for palms, I can't talk for other plant families, but um, for palms at least, those two places, Vietnam, um, it was especially diverse, especially poorly known. And I think there's almost certainly, I don't think we finished in Vietnam, almost certainly more um, species to find. I am pretty sure that Sulawesi, as I say, I felt when I was in Sulawesi that I hardly scratched the surface. And I think Sulawesi is a wonderfully interesting place um, and probably many more species, certainly many more species of palms. Um, the Malaccas, the islands just to the east of Sulawesi, virtually uncollected palms. Um, I think the neotropics probably we have a reasonably good, good knowledge, but having said that, there are still large areas of the, especially the northern, um, the upper Rio Negro region of Brazil is certainly very poorly collected. So yes, there are still lots of areas I think I feel this very strongly. That there's still many, many places where we should be um, collecting plants. It's a very simple process, but it's a very—I think it's very important. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so we have some comments saying this was really wonderful that the Fulbright program and others were able to support your research in botany um, and also teaching. Um, can you talk a little bit about the teaching process? Um, were there any challenges involved in, in teaching folks in other countries uh, about palms? Yeah, challenges, yes. Um, I did a little bit of teaching in, well, the most teaching I did in was in Sulawesi. It was, uh, actually it was very, it was wonderful in a way. It was, there was a difficulty because many of them didn't, didn't speak English. So there always had to be a translator present. But they were really, you know, these were young people who really were interested. They wanted to know about, uh, I, I think I had the impression that even though they lived in, in these were people, mo probably mostly from city people, had no idea the diversity of, uh, of their own country. And so it was really actually a, a very nice experience. Always nice to work with young people when you get old like me. Um. Were, uh, are to your knowledge, are there medicinal uses of palms? Oh, yeah, not so many. Um, yes, but actually considering how many species there are, considering how useful, palms are one of the most 
They say that palms are the third most useful plant family after legumes and grasses. Considering how useful they are, very few um, medicinal uses. Mike Bailick would know more about that than me. I think um, I think dragon's blood from the seed from the fruits of of, a, of some species of calamus are used medicinally, but generally generally not. Generally, they're not very medicinally important. Thank you. Um, we had a great question. I'm now I'm trying to find it. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, this is from Sinway Sia. Uh, Greetings from tropical Singapore. Is mm -hmm. there any way we can better protect uh, these forests where the palms you're collecting are? And I think an uh, important um, follow-up to that is also what are some of the causes of deforestation in these areas? And, and then how can we, how can folks can make an impact in those countries? Oh my God, that is a, that's a, that's a, Terribly difficult question. Um, when I, the background to my research over the years, these almost 40 years I've worked in New York, the background is this sort of relentless destruction of, of not just tropical forests, but sort of destruction of the, of the natural world. And I just, I don't know, I guess when you get older, you probably get more pessimistic. I just cannot see that, uh, that it's going to stop. I don't know what the answer is. I've thought about it a lot and I just don't know what the answer is. I think, um, who knows? I, I, I don't ever see deforestation stopping. I don't see, even though now we know the consequences, we know what's going to happen. We know about climate change. I just cannot see that, uh, that, it, that it's going to stop. It's, anyway, it's, too, it's a very difficult question. Because there are a lot of, lot of um, uses for these forests by, by folks of all kinds. I think that's a big part oh, yeah, of it. Yeah, it's just, yeah, exactly. Um, we have a question from uh, someone familiar, Barbara Tears. Um, oh. Andrew, as you're, as you're well aware, palms can be challenging to prepare as a herbarium specimen. I think anyone who's, who's handled palms in any form kind of knows about their, their challenges because of their size and their bulkiness and spikes of all kinds. Um, could you describe what you think are some of the best techniques for making scientifically valuable herbarium specimens as a specialist yourself? Yeah, well, I think there's two, some of, yeah, there's several, um, several things that we try and do when we collect specimens. Many of the earlier specimens, I was talking earlier about calamus specimens, are very, very poorly made and scrappy specimens and very, not very useful for a systematist. So I think the most important thing, palms are more difficult, yes, is to try and make as complete um, notes as possible when you're collecting the specimen, the, how the stem is branching or not branching, the leaves, the number of leaflets, all these kind of things. Measure lots of things and make notes about all these different aspects. And also take pictures because I find, um, I take lots of pictures of specimens. I find that um, later these pictures are really useful. So I think trying to make complete specimens, and that, yes, admittedly palms are very bulky and difficult to collect but trying to make as complete specimens as possible and trying to make as many notes as possible and take as many pictures as possible is um, very important. It takes a lot of time. We, we can spend hours um, that, with that elephant, for example, collecting that rattan. You know, you could spend three or four hours just making one specimen. It's not something you can, you can do, you can rush into. Mm -hmm. no, not easy. Palms are intractable, not easy to collect. And it's part of the problem with also sending them across the, the world to, to be studied, I'm sure. Yeah, you said that again. Um, so Jordan asks, um, why do you think that some of the species of palms are so incredibly widespread and abundant, while others, sometimes in the very same genus, are quite rare or range restricted? Well, that's a very, that's a very good question. You know, when people don't know the answers to a question, they'll say, well, that's a good question. I don't know, but it's certainly very, very true that um, in almost any genus of palms that you look at, you will find a few very widespread species and a few very, very narrowly distributed species. And I think that's just the way, I don't know the answer to the question, but I'm, I'm certain that's, um, that's true for practically any palm genus. You have these um, contrasts between these very widespread and very narrowly distributed species. The reason I couldn't say, I'd have to, you'd have to get an ecologist to tell you um, the answer to that question. Thank you. Um, 
Lance asks, what percentage of palm species do you think are still undescribed in the world? And are the remaining species most likely to be found in already known species complexes that still need to be broken up? Yes, that's another good question. Um, I think I talked earlier about delimiting species uh, using based on morphology. I think that, that it's very likely that molecular data will that everybody will in the future be using molecular data that people will using morphology from herbarium specimens will be regarded as as prehistoric and i think once that happens once we start using molecular data to limit species we will certainly find a huge difference in the number of species we recognize now between and between the number of species we recognize based on molecular data and it could well be that there may be many many more species of course that depends how you define species but my impression is that we're going to find many more species, um, but not necessarily finding them when we're in the field, but much more likely finding them in the lab using um, using molecular data. So yes, I expect the numbers to change. I don't think there's a lot of sort of new species to be necessary to be found in in the wild. Much more likely in the in the lab. So field work is essential, basically. Yeah. Um, so Justin asks, I think, a pertinent question for a lot of folks on the line who are coming to us um, with uh, either a lot of experience or, or interest in getting involved in the kind of work that you do. Um, and thinking about NYC students and the diversity of aspiring scientists or plant enthusiasts, what recommendations do you have for students that may want to pursue a career similar to yours? And also, what other careers or jobs are connected to your work that young people can pursue? Lord, that's, a, that's another good question. <laughs> that's another question I don't know the answer to. Unfortunately, the number of opportunities for, um, for botanists is limited. I think that's, that's always been the case. I don't think, you know, systematic botany has never been very well funded. There are, there are sort of, I showed that picture early on of the, of the staff in, what was it, 1987 or whenever it was. And I think we have less people now. I don't think we're increasing the number of people. So um, there are still there are still opportunities. There are still um, positions. I, I, I hope in the future there will be positions at the botanical garden. But it's certainly not a. There are not a lot of. I would say there are not a lot of opportunities at the um, to do systematic botany at the moment. I wish I could. I wish I could be more optimistic about that. But I. I don't think. Uh, I don't think there are that many opportunities, but certainly maybe in, in sort of environmental studies type things, maybe there are more, um, maybe in conservation, these kind of things, maybe there are more opportunities. But I think in, if you actually wanted to be a systematic botanist, I think it would be, um, there are a few opportunities now. I think I was very lucky because I, I was in the right place at the right time. Well, I, from judging from your talk, I think an important starting point for you was finding a mentor. Um, yeah. And I think that's still true. Um, I would say if, if you are committed and passionate about something and you find someone else who's committed and passionate as well and can guide you along, I think that's, I mean, that's a great lesson I think we can all take. Um, and I, I think that's true at all times, no matter, no matter the odds. Um, and there are plenty of, I think, um, opportunities now with digitization being a big aspect yeah digital data becoming more common, it makes some of the research that would have been impossible to do previously more possible because information can be accessed from different places around the world. So I, I want to add a, a positive note saying that there is hope, um, well, but folks, folks like that really try to get involved and find folks that um, can, 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 can mentor you. Charlie, you answered that better. You answered that question much better than I did. <laughs> um, let me see here. Um, I've, I think, uh, oh, some folks have asked us more about the forests um, in Sulawesi. Mm -hmm. And are those uh, old growth forests? Are those regenerated forests? Those are, those are pretty mixed forests. Sulawesi is an interesting place because it, there's those several peninsulas that stick out east and west and south. Some of those, some areas are certainly, um, very deforested. The northeastern peninsula and the southwestern peninsula are very um, highly deforested. 
but those there are still remaining forests. Those, whether they're primary forests or secondary forests, they've certainly been disturbed because people collect, um, people have been collecting rattans, for example, from forests in Sulawesi for the last, I don't know how long, 100 years at least. And still there's a huge amount of rattan collected from the forest. So they're not virgin forests. They're not intact forests that have never been disturbed. They've certainly been, um, they've been, um, different plants have been collected from the forest, but nevertheless, they are still, um, from, but from a botanical point of view, they're still pretty much intact forests. Still, still lots of plants to collect in those forests. Thank you. Um, some folks have asked a little bit more about the fieldwork challenges in, in certain countries that have been, had um, different kinds of, of, of political violence and, and things like that. Have you encountered issues with um, those things during your career? Um, not especially, no. I would say I don't think so. Um, Vietnam, I was, when I first went to Vietnam, I was a little bit hesitant because I, I thought, as I say, when I say as an American, that sounds a bit strange. But anyway, as an American visiting Vietnam, um, that people might be might be slightly hostile, but that the opposite was true. Vietnamese people are wonderfully um, friendly, very extraordinarily open and friendly. And, and the fact that the the Vietnam War didn't really it never really came up. So I don't think certainly in Vietnam, um, I didn't never really felt any of any um, any of that kind of thing. Other places, some places are not so, Sulawesi, for example, was more difficult to work because there's very tremendous bureaucracy. And Indonesia is famous for its, uh, for its bureaucracy. So it's any number of letters and forms and this and that you have to, hoops you have to jump through before you can do field work. Um, but in general, um, it's much, I would say in general, it's more difficult these days. There are many more, um, many more hurdles to doing field work, certainly in places like Brazil, it's certainly, I think it's more difficult now than it was in the past. Um, but in general, I think it's, uh, I, I never really experienced any, any, any of those kind of problems. Um, Rob asks, in your retirement, do you plan to continue revising Palm Genera? And if yes, and if you feel comfortable saying, uh, please mention um, some of the foci for your current and future revisionary studies? Oh, that's an uh, easy question at last. Um, yes, I do plan to. And I, um, I've actually been going into the office three days a week in the last few weeks, and hopefully it will be able to be. So I, said I plan to keep working. I can't quite imagine stopping doing um, research. I'm working on three genera at the moment. One is. Um, one is a genus Iguanura, and I've just got a grant from NSF to do um, to do some herbarium work in Asia on that genus. I'm working on a um, another genus, Cocothrinax, a Caribbean genus. I'm a bit stuck at the moment because of not being able to visit herbaria. And a third genus, Lanonia, the one I talked about. I'm looking again at Lanonia, so I'll I'll be pottering about in the herbarium, looking at those looking at those genera. Very good, thank you. And um, of course, those Jen are already called by you, but are there uh, other topics in palm biology that you think would be great for aspiring graduate students interested in palm systematics? Oh my God, there's so many, so much stuff to, so many things to know. In systematics, I think one of the most interesting things is that we have in palms and I'm sure in many other groups, species complexes. These are these very widespread, complicated, variable species. And they, we cannot really, you can't really understand them based on herbarium specimens. They're just, just not possible. And I think that those, who knows how those things evolved. It's just, to me, it's very difficult to imagine how they could have. So I think that um, will be in the future, we can try and understand that a lot better. And that will lead back to what I was to question earlier about did I think there'll be more species? I think, yes, probably there will be, because once we try and understand these complexes, we may end up with lots of different. But as far as the ecology of palms, yes, my God, we know so little. There's so many things to, uh, we know very little about pollination. We know little about dispersal. We know so many things in ecology that we, we don't know about palms. Palms, are, I've said this earlier, a little bit difficult to work with. Um, so 
we you have to be sort of I think pollination is probably one of the most to me one of the most interesting um, things we know very little about pollination of plants. Thank you that's that gives us all a lot to look forward to and, and oh, uh, there's an open book basically to be discovered. Thank you. That again. Um, so at this point, um, we're sort of reached the end of our time for today. Um, there are always more questions, but we never have enough time to get to everything. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us, um, mm -hmm. to share your experience about studying diversity and economic importance as well of, of palms around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone here in our audience today for jo joining today's presentation. And if you missed any part of the event or wish to watch it again, a recording will be saved and then shared online in the NYBG lecture library. We hope you'll join us for future science, conservation and humanities lectures from the New York Botanical Garden. Upcoming on Friday, uh, January 22nd and on the 29th, we have two more uh, plant science talks by newly emeritus curators, Dr. Robin Moran and Waite Thomas. So stay tuned for these invitations to learn more about plants and celebrate the careers of world-renowned scientists here at NYBG. And for those who haven't already registered for our mailing list, uh, you can go ahead and sign up using the link I'm just about to send in the chat. So until next time, please stay well, stay green, and take care. Goodbye, everyone, and thank you once again, Andrew. Thank you.